Okay, so in this part, we're going to look at how we can use NumPy to generate random numbers and then do statistics. Um, so I guess it's probably fairly clear why you might want to go and do statistics with um, calculations, but where do the random numbers come into? Well, random numbers are actually used an awful lot in, in uh, uh, scientific computing and in, in especially in, in certain types of um, uh, theoretical modeling and um, uh, simulations. So there's a whole branch of uh, numerical simulations uh, that's widely used in theoretical physics uh, called Monte Carlo methods, which are essentially based on um, uh, repeatedly carrying out a, a calculation with different random numbers and working out what the probability of certain answers are. Um, this is a whole series of topics that will be introduced more thoroughly uh, for the students doing advanced uh, doing advanced techniques in theoretical physics. So those doing the MPhys in theoretical physics. Um, we have a whole section of the module there, which is looking at um, doing Monte Carlo simulations and the role of random numbers. Um, more pragmatically, random numbers are also really useful just for demonstrating bits of um, code. OK, so um, in NumPy, we have a whole module dot random, which uh, then has a whole series of different uh, functions with it, which can produce random numbers with different distributions. So uh, the easiest one is uniform, um, and uniform can take a low value and a high value, and it will give you numbers that start with a low value and go up, but don't include the high value. Um, it takes a size parameter, which can either be just be a straight number, or it can be a tuple that describes the shape of the output array that's wanted. Um, uh, and so here I've just gone and calculated um, a set of random numbers between uh, one and a spigeon less than seven. Um, and I'm going to call it NP dice. Um, and the reason for that will come clear in just a second. So we have a list of 100 random numbers. Um, so the random numbers are generated as floating point numbers. Um, uh, and um, therefore, they'll take any value. Um, uh, between the low and up to, but not quite including the high value. Um, okay, so for our example, we're in fact going to want uh, our numbers to be integers because we're going to use these random numbers to represent the throws of a dice. So um, there's a couple of ways we could do that. We could simply convert the, the D type of the array um, that we're generating. Um, the easiest way to do this is with the as type method. Um, and so we simply um, do that. You can also feed a D type into the random number generator to tell it what type of data to generate. So, okay, we've converted our list of uh, dice rolls from floating point numbers, which don't really make sense if it's supposed to be a dice roll, to a set of integers. Okay, so um, this then, um, when we could do the as type, we're simply discarding the um, floating point part, the, the fractional part of the of our random numbers. So this is behaving just like you do with int uh, with a floating point number. So if you do int brackets 3.7, it returns three and not four. Um, so um, uh, alternatively, we've got another function we can also use in there. Uh, the random modules a random int function which will automatically just produce you integers because in fact, it's such a common requirement to go and produce random integers. Okay, um, so what we've looked at therefore is a uniform distribution. So that means you're equally likely to get any number between the low value and the high value. But again, often what you actually want to go and do is uh, be able to pick random numbers that if you then build a histogram of lots of them up together, would form some kind of known distribution. And so the normal distribution is one of the common ones you might want to use. And so that's built into the um, uh, Python, in, into the NumPy library. So in the ran NumPy random module, you have a function called normal, and that uh, takes a few parameters. It takes one that defines the central point, the peak value um, of your distribution. It takes something which defines the width of your distribution. And then again, it takes the size in the same way. And you can see in this example, I've asked it to give me a size between, which is a tuple, say I want five rows and 10 columns. And so what I get out is a set of random numbers um, with um, uh, centered around about four, 
and with a uh, standard deviation, uh, that's what the scale parameter is basically telling you, of 0 0.5. And so if you just look at those numbers there, you can see that that's roughly right what we've got. Everything is basically starting either three or four, and that's because the probability of being more than uh, two standard deviations away is about 5%, um, and I've only got 50 numbers, so it's not that surprising we don't see um, many examples of them. Okay, um, so as I said, we're giving it a two-dimensional array. So we can get some statistical information about our array. Um, so there's a whole bunch of st stats we can do on it. We can um, ask it for um, the maximum value um, and we can ask it for the minimum value. Um, and we can ask it for um, the median value um, or indeed you can ask it for the mean value. Um, as you see, the mean value is uh, nearly, very, very nearly to four. The reason it's not exactly four when we asked it to give us a random distribution centered around four is simply because we haven't got enough data points there. So um, uh, if you um, work out the uncertainty in that mean, then you'd find it did in fact also include four as being um, within the probability of that being the mean value. Um, and we can ask for the standard deviation. Um, uh, okay, which doesn't quite line up with the scale. There's a, there's a factor that um, it differs by, but again, um, the numbers won't line up anyway because we haven't got enough data points um, to, to calculate the, the values correctly. Um, okay, other things you can do, you can sum the whole of the array um, and you can work out the product. So that's where you multiply every element together um, and add it up. Um, obviously, um, both the sum and the product um, uh, are rather large numbers, but um, that's what you'd expect given the data we've got. So we can also look at, say, the frequencies with which values appear by looking at a non-p histogram. Um, so if we now look um, at a histogram uh, using the, the np.histogram function, so I've given it our random data, I've told it I want it to construct five different um, probability bins for us there. Um, and so what it does is it returns two arrays. So it returns the um, numbers it's found in each bin. And it also returns the uh, second array. You see that second array has got six numbers and that's the um, edges of the, of the bins it's used. So it says they, it found eight values between uh, 3.18 and 3.48 roughly, and then 14 values between there and 3.78, um, and then nine values between four point, um, there and 4.07, and another nine values between there up to 4.07 and 4.37 and so on through. Um, and you can see that this is where you start showing that although it's um, uh, calculated as, as a normal distribution, unless you have really large numbers, the thing's not going to look totally like a normal distribution um, because, of course, you'd have expected that the um, first and last bin were the smallest and the uh, middle bin was the biggest, and that's not quite what we've got. Um, okay, so that's what I was just saying. The first value you get back from histogram is the number of, uh, is the number of counts in each bin, and the second one is the um, the, the um, left and right um, edges of each bin. Um, and just to say, there is in fact a matplotlib function histogram, or hist rather, which essentially calls numpy histogram inside it and then gives you a plot of that histogram as well. Okay, so another thing you might well want to go and do is try and locate the biggest and the smallest values in a um, array. So the um, this is done with the argmax and the argmin function. So this is not returning the biggest value, but it's returning where the biggest value is and where the biggest, where, where the smallest value is. So it's returning the position within the array. So if we just run that um, over our array, it tells us the biggest value was at position 46 and the smallest value was at position 30. Now the question there is, well, what does that mean? Because in fact, that set of data we were using was five rows by 10 columns. So where exactly in those rows and columns is position 46 and position 30? 
So um, the way we get around this is we um, go and uh, ask it to work out, um, having known the, the shape of the array we're working with, ask it to convert out what the, where the position was. Um, and so there is a, um, a handy function here called numpy unravel index, and you feed it in the position. So our 46, so we're doing a call to NP argmax uh, random data. And then we tell it what shape the data we were using is. And it comes back and tells us that position 46, in fact, as it turns out, is very easy in this case, it's row four, column six. Um, so it's the bottom row and the seventh element along. Um, uh, it just so happens that with the shape of the data we've got, because we've got 10 columns, the, um, the positions tend to map rather nicely to, to where they actually are in the, in the data set. So this brings us to a, 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 another um, thing you come across in NumPy, so that um, in some cases NumPy will take your two-dimensional array, will do something with it, and will return it back as a 1D array. In other cases, you might have a function that actually is going to work best if it just works with a 1D array and you want to um, start off with a two-dimensional array. So there is a function called Ravel um, that is used to go and take a multi-dimensional array and convert it just into a long stream of single array of, of numbers. Um, so in a sense, it unpacks all the dimensions and just gives you a one-dimensional array of all the elements in order. Um, so then in order to reverse that, to bring it back into the shape you want it, you can use the numpy.reshape function, which is something we saw uh, in the first unit of this series. So as an example here, if we um, ravel um, the random data and then say, okay, tell us what shape this ravel data has, then it tells us it's turned it into something which is just 50 rows um, long. So it's a one dimensional array of 50 values. Whereas we started with a two-dimensional array of five rows and 10 columns. And then we can reshape it back into uh, our, our original shape. So we can just do uh, np.reshape, feed it the Ravel data, um, and then the shape it should go back into. Um, and ask it what shape we get back. And it says it's five rows by 10 columns, which is good because that's what we just told it to do. But then we can just do the sanity check and check that our reshaped data is in fact the same thing as our random data that we started with. And you can see here that because every element here is true, that means for every single element, the, the values were true, the, the values were in fact equal. So in other words, our reshaped array is indeed exactly the same as our original random data. So the reshape has reversed the process of raffling it. So as I said, raveling is particularly useful when you need to go and pass a multi-dimensional array into some function that's only expected to get one-dimensional arrays. And then it can do its calculations, whatever it's going to do, sends back its results, and then you can reshape them back to make your nice 2D data array again. OK, so if we are working with 2D or indeed higher dimensional data, how do we get these statistics to work? So we showed before that you could just use uh, np.mean and calculate the um, mean value of a complete array. But if, for example, you have a two-dimensional array of data where the uh, columns mean different things, just getting the mean value for all the data isn't perhaps very meaningful. So if your data, for example, is a collection of um, time and position values, it just doesn't make sense to take the average of all time and position values as a single number because they, they're just representing different quantities. What you wanted to go and do is take the um, mean of the time and the mean of the position, for example. Um, or alternatively, you might want to go and um, uh, take uh, a mean of every of all the values in a single row. Um, depends what your problem is. So all of these statistical functions I'm showing you will take an access keyword, and this is basically telling you which direction should it do the operation in. So if I say access equals zero, um, then what I'm saying with the mean function is it should calculate the mean um, working down each column um, and calculate a separate mean for all the rows. Um, if I do the same with sum, I'm doing the same thing. I'm saying calculate the sum down all the rows. 
So um, here, for example, I'm going to ask it to go and uh, tell me the maximum value um, in my random data. But I'm going to say axis equals zero. So I'm saying calculate the maximum value over all the rows, but for each column. And so what I get back is 10 values because I had 10 columns. So this is the maximum value in the first column, the second column, the third column, and so on. Alternatively, I say axis equals one, then I'm saying calculate the value working my way along the uh, different columns. So I get a different value for each row. Um, so in this case, I've calculated the mean value for each row. And because I had five rows, I get five values. Um, and again, you argmin and argmax work the same. So in this case, I'm going to ask it to find me the uh, position of the smallest value in our data. Um, axis equals ones, meaning that we're going to uh, work our way across the columns. Um, and so we get one value for each row. So this tells us where the position of which column the smallest value is in for each row. Um, 